Hi, folks. Welcome. This is Google Plus Week. We're getting ready to start uh, the produced version, which I'm going to do right now. Um, spam zero. So it'll be just about 30 seconds. I'm running the intro now is what, what's going on. And welcome, I'm Dan McDermott. This is Google Plus Week, our unofficial look at the world's coolest social layer, uh, to be official. Okay, so uh, let's let's look at the panel here. We've got um, we've got Mr. Anthony Clauser in Rochester, New York. Welcome, Anthony. We have in Lynchburg, Virginia, we have Mr. Bruce Turner. Always a pleasure, Bruce. Good evening. Craig Ship joins us from Florida, where he is tan, rested, and ready. Yes. California, we Absolutely. have uh, Dr. Gary Levin. Gary, always a pleasure. Welcome, sir. In California, aircraft enthusiast Jeff Sias <laughs> from, from the market.com. And the ever charming and occasionally grouchy, usually toward Craig Ship, we have M. Monica. M. Monica, welcome to our humble. Hey. <laughs> I really do enjoy Craig Ship's presence, I'd like to clarify. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Monica, let me begin with you. Tell me, um, there was a space event. First of all, I want to talk about this this hangout thing. But apparently, the Mars rover um, broke a rock and the first time analyzed a rock on oh. another planet, and it was green. So, what does this tell us about our folklore? Is this more evidence? Um, that it's made of green cheese or whatever. Little no. green men. Green <laughs> men. I think so. I think or green men. No, it, this doesn't tell us any. You know, apocryphal it's, legend is true. But it does, you know, set records and that we now have, you know, the first rocks that have been extracted from below the surface. So that's cool. Um, and we can the continue. Thing. The other thing that was awesome was that there was this uh, the the first ever Google Plus Hangout from space, and in uh, I heard about it a few days ago when everybody else did, and then I saw a tweet today from the Make a Wish Foundation that was retweeted by NASA, um, and uh, they had a a, a Make a Wish a Wish kid in the Hangout. So tell us about this uh, really cool event. Tell us what happened. That's so cool. I did not know there was actually a Make-A-Wish kid in the Hangout, but that is makes it extra special. Um, they had some, some school kids, a couple of classrooms in the Hangout um, from different areas of the country, um, and then they had some pre-recorded YouTube questions, which were really cool. I really thought that they selected some questions that were really excellent. If you haven't gotten a chance to watch the video, watch it. Um, even though it's not live, it's still amazing. It, and watching it after the fact is, you know, it's still as compelling. I was sleeping at the time the Hangout went on, but I watched it afterward and, you know, it's still really great. Um, it was super cool because you see the astronauts, you know, floating in zero gravity. And, like I said, they took some really cool questions. And I think it was one of the best Hangouts I've seen. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so check it out. The, the quality seemed really good to me, considering it was coming from outer space. I mean, that was amazing. Did, were, yeah. were you all, all impressed with the quality of it as well? Absolutely. I was, wondering, I was wondering, there didn't seem to be much lag, and the quality was excellent. Did they have an internet link up and down, or is it all by, by high band uh, VHF or UHF? Mm. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly how the internet was uh, managed, but they were doing it live with the schools for sure. So even though they were also taking pre-recorded yeah. YouTube questions, they were doing it live with the schools. They probably didn't have internet up there 
I mean, they might have just had a video feed going in and out, you know, and, and yeah. relaying it. Somehow. Well, somehow, somehow NASA has to communicate live with the right. astronauts. Yeah. So, so yeah, they, I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't really matter what you call it, whether you call it a video feed or the internet. Right? I mean, you, you're probably right. It probably was just an, uh, a video feed, but you know, yeah. you still got to get a relative amount of data, whether you know, yeah. down to the plant to Earth. Yeah, I, but yeah, I just don't think that they have an IP address up there. That I mean, who knows? They might. You never know. So, <laughs> well, I would suggest that they were yeah, doing no, this. They don't have a Google I would, fiber. I would suggest that 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 Google is doing this through NASA's headquarters. Right. Right. Yeah. So, and, and I think and I think the the thing with the 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 rover was the first time a robot actually drilled into a planet, not extracted a rock, but drilled drilled down into it. So, I think that's how they. That was the first, because they've extracted rocks from planets before, but not like that. I think, uh, yeah, uh, the the thing I was impressed the most about, I mean, it was awesome to have a hangout from space, and the quality was good because I think they were using YouTube live streaming, which is 720p versus what we have, is, which is 480. But um, there was no noticeable delay. Uh, I remember, and Gary... And Bruce, you guys are old enough to remember that. And of course, Jeff, you know, our senior statesman here, um, we're old enough to remember that the, the original Nightline episode when they were, uh, I guess, in Iran or nearby, and they, they were first started to use satellites. And Ted Koppel would ask a question, then there'd be a delay, then the guy would answer, and um, then there'd be a delay, and then Ted would answer. Um, and there was none of that. I mean, it's it's amazing uh, how this uh, technology has progressed. I mean, they're in space, and it's like they're talking. I guess it's the same thing. If you figure, I mean, if you're going to Australia, but I mean, the, the space station. I'm not sure how many miles that up is up in the air. Well, uh, constantly we're talking with people that are live on the other side of the world. I mean, if we had Brad in here from Australia, you know, technically, he's on the other side of the planet. Um, and if you think about this, it's kind of mind blowing that you can be talking to someone who's on the other side of the planet and there's no delay. So basically, we know what the next question needs to be via YouTube to uh, the space station. How do you get the, <laughs> the communication down to Earth during the hangouts? In, in real time, yeah, versus the four second delay. Yeah. Now, um, I, I did not watch much of it, just maybe like five minutes, but they were talking about um, a, a delay of some sort, so... Yeah, usually a del there's usually a four-second delay in, in, like, if you had satellite TV versus terrestrial TV, you know, it's like four seconds for it to bounce back out, down from the satellite, for, so I think, yeah, I don't know. How what they're doing, so they're probably making up for that. They're actually a lot closer than Brad, Monica. That's, that was a prescient observation. Um, uh, from here to New Orleans, where I'm in Virginia, I think it's like 1,200 miles. Same thing to Miami, um, and the space station is only anywhere between 173 and 286 miles. Mm -hmm. It's actually closer than Brad. Like it, it's not like they can, you know, the space station can just, you know, interact with a, a satellite and the satellite interact with Earth, because there was actually a question specifically about um, how often they see satellites, and I'm going to paraphrase, of course, but basically their answer was that they are moving so fast and that the satellites are moving so fast that they rarely do see satellites, and when they do see satellite, it's only for a split second as it, you know, so they can't, like, you know, shoot a signal at a satellite. Yeah, my, my guess is that Space Station has its own satellite on it. You know that for communications, it's not it's bouncing a, off a, a signal off another one. Yeah, it, it is a it, it is, is a floating satellite. satellite. Right? Yeah, satellite yeah, exactly. Something revolves around the Earth. Um, well, in terms of communication, it probably has its own satellite communication encased in it or uh, attached to it. I, that's what my point. I'm guessing that's why they had to scoot right at 11:30 or, or whatever time it was, because um, they started at 10:30 Eastern. And then they had, I guess, one hour, and then they had to roll because they said that there are 16 sunsets and sunrises in the hangout and that they couldn't rely. One of the questions was, how do you sleep? You know, And they said, well, we can't rely on sunlight because there's 16 days and nights in a 24-hour period. So I'm guessing that 
whatever connection they had, they, they were going to lose, you know, and have to switch to a new one. So that's but one one thing they I, I, I did catch was they uh, debunked the idea that you could actually see with the naked eye the Great Wall of China from the stage the yeah. space station. You they cannot. So yes, that's a very pervasive myth. Uh, it somehow succeeds in like. People love to spread that one. You absolutely cannot. Cannot see that one. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's a really long wall. It's You can't see it from space. Okay, so we have exhausted space. Um, yep, let's move on to the next topic. Uh, Google is hiring um, yep. engineers for the Hangout and Talk team in Stockholm. And just to remind folks, that uh, Hangouts began when Chichu was asked by Sergey Brin and uh, or Larry Page and uh, 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 Vic and Dotra to come up with a, a messaging system because I think at the time he was heading up the Google Talk team and they were using for talk they were using a constant video feed similar to the Hangouts that we have now uh, to communicate with their team in Stockholm, Sweden and so um, uh, Stockholm, of course, has a long connection with Hangouts since that's where it, where it began. So tell us about this, Monica. Right. So the link just basically links to a, um, a Google uh, person who says that they're looking for, you know, engineers who know what they're doing um, to join the Hangouts and Google team in Stockholm. So apparently they're looking for someone who's already in Sweden and who is a uh, qualifying engineer. Um, so if you know someone who's in that area, who's qualified, refer them. That's right. all I got to say. <laughs> Bruce, make sure you get all your, your Swedish contacts up to speed on this uh, new gig opportunity here. Well, I don't know if they're Swedish contacts. They're the only ones they're looking for. Can you hear me okay? It looks like my mic may be a little bit low. It's a little low, but you're okay. Yeah. Uh, I... We've actually got a guy. Uh, you sound good to me. You know who I'm talking about, the guy in uh, North Dakota that's had four interviews now with Google about a position over there, and that I think it's in it's one of the Scandinavian countries that may be, uh, I, I know it's, yeah, well, it's either Stockholm or Switzerland somewhere. Okay. Cool. Well, I don't, you know, um, since we don't have any more information, you know, like he basically just posted that they're looking for someone on that team. I don't know. Um Maybe they're looking for, you know, willing to relocate someone. Um, I have no information on that topic. I think they're uh, heavily recruiting in the in the Dakotas. <laughs> I would imagine you have an edge if you already live in Sweden, <laughs> Norway, or Finland. Indeed. I um, imagine they won't have any problem filling that slot. I can't wait for this movie that's going to come out. Um, that was a hysterical trailer. Did you, did you, did you guys see that? The, no. What's uh, that? Burns applying for a job at Google. It's a, the comedy movie that's coming out. They filmed it at Google. It's hysterical. Um, uh, it's a must see. Uh, okay. So, um, all right. So next up in uh, headline, in battle with Amazon, Google hardens its cloud services. Right, right. Okay. So, um yeah, basically, Google is beefing up its technical support options for businesses who use its sweeping collection of cloud services. Um, and so now they're having several plans, um, including a bronze, silver, gold, and platinum plan, um, which is great. Um, And uh, so basically these are, you know, a different tiered plans with, with different levels of support and obviously different payment levels. Um, the top one is Platinum, um, which gets the customer direct access to a technical account manager team. Um, I think focusing on customer service in general is a really good idea. Um, the way I saw it first presented, Monica, was kind of like, okay, uh, when I first saw it, it, it said Google, you know, offers this support starting at zero dollars, but the zero dollars is access to our customer forums and our help 
FAQs or what. I mean, it was no no support, right? And then yeah. I guess it's it, it, the first year is what a hundred fifty a month or something or whatever it is. It's it's a lot. So this is not the host, you know, for people hosting their WordPress site. Um, this is uh, you know a significant chunk of change. I'm not sure where that noise is coming from, and I don't see green bar. Yeah, I heard a sudden change in audio. Did anyone else hear it? Yeah, I'm not sure what that is. No. Um, and it also, just, I, don't, I don't know if this oh. is related, but did, there, there, was, there was a post from Robert Scoble where Rackspace has cut their prices for hosting by 33%. Um, so, but we've, we've seen this constantly, Monica, haven't we? Where uh, every company uh, is... Uh, I don't know where this is coming from. Yeah, this, this uh, the audio suddenly got bad. Jeff, uh, can you try, Jeff, try muting. Okay. I think it's you. Yep, it's but you. We're we're seeing these companies, Amazon and Google, they're they're constantly lowering their rates, and, and usually by significant margins, enough to to be newsy, and get that free media about it, because uh, yep. it's a big race to to host, and apparently it's it's a profitable place uh, to be. Um, but I know Amazon, I guess, is the leader, right? Because uh, when Amazon yeah. goes down, all these gigantic services like Netflix and, I mean, big, big outfits uh, go down uh, when Netflix has a problem. Yep. Amazon has a problem. What, what, you're correct, when, when Amazon has a problem. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, back to Europe. The EU may take action against Google over its privacy policy. I see that. I guess right. it went to, was it France or Germany? Uh, Eric Schmidt went, and uh, I think France, and, and they came to terms. Uh, and then some other EU countries have uh, criticized that step, uh, criticized France for settling too early. And then there was this thing um, I posted right. uh, today, and, and some Europeans were weighing in, defending the, this uh, German thing. But anyway, t tell us about the, the privacy thing, and then we'll get into that. So basically, they um, uh, they combined sixty separate privacy policies into one agreement, and um, so this is what you know the EU has an issue with. Um, they want Google to reinforce users' consent, and they want them to do this by allowing members to choose under what circumstances data about them was combined by asking them to click on dedicated buttons and they feel that Google should offer a centralized opt-out tool and allow users to decide which of Google's services provide data about them so basically what the EU wants is for Google not to have one centralized privacy policy but they want one centralized opt-out option I mean the fact that one company can't provide one privacy policy is just silly. I mean, that to me, one privacy policy makes more sense um, because obviously one privacy policy is more consistent and easier to know exactly what you're doing with than, you know, having 50 different privacy policies, you know, across like Gmail and YouTube. Nobody reads and, these. Um, I mean you know, well, no one well but that's either. part you that's part of the common, EU's objection common with thing, right? the I mean, end user common, license agreement. The Creative Commons licensing, for example, um, lots of different sort sites use that, and say you know like nonprofits or you know Wikipedia uses it, and everyone, all of us know what it is. You basically have to credit your source, and and you can can use it. And um, any works you create from it, you have to also allow people to use, or you know, some variation of that. And it's a simple terms of service. Well, and that's exactly why Creative Commons you know was, was created. Okay. But at the same time, you know, even Creative Commons have, has come to the point where there's, you know, so many Creative Commons licenses that a person can pick that you know it's no longer consistent. Like they were trying to be in the first place. <laughs> Privacy policies are complicated. That's just the way that it is because the point of a privacy policy, well, along with terms of service, is to legally protect, um, it, well, terms of service is to legally protect the company and basically privacy policies are to some extent to protect the, the um, consumer. Um, like I said, 
I don't understand why the EU is having an issue with one company having one privacy policy. And I would, I would say that the EU is traditionally um, overreaching, and that this may be a case of the EU just overreaching like they usually do. Mm, I would say that um, one of the arguments that they've made in the past is that the EU LA um, most uh, customers don't actually read them, um, which is true. <laughs> Eddie which Izzard is not has the a whole of the bit company, on this. Though. Like mm. his his whole comedy writ is like that when you are presented with this, you don't read any of it because to start reading any of it means that like you just scroll to the end and you hit accept because you don't want to start reading it because then you're sucked into reading the whole document and, and no, you, so you just click upset, accept. Of course I've read all the terms of this. He, he does it specifically with Apple because he's an Apple user. Um, but uh, Real quick, Monica, Alan is with us. Alan, are you there? Hi, Dan. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Yes. Um, okay. Awesome. So anyway, we're we're uh, finishing up our talk on the um, Europe's commitment to privacy and virulent hatred for Google. So are we um, more of their indecision for what they want? <laughs> um, they want they want multiple privacy. Um, multiple privacy policies but one opt-out privacy um, tool. As crazy as they are about wanting to be paid for everything, all these, you know, for someone to direct traffic to them, I do respect their, their much stronger commitment to internet privacy than America has. I totally agree with this. And I can give you a crazy story from this week as to why privacy is so important. Um, it's a little not suitable for work, but <laughs> Craig is here, so go ahead. Uh, it's it it is juicy. It's going to drive your viewership straight through the roof. <laughs> oh there is this new blog um, for. Um, female, how should we say, female body acceptance, where women who have been watching um, pornographic videos have felt that their bodies are inadequate. And so, as a result, they decided that in order to make them feel that their bodies are acceptable, they decided to take a picture of their anatomy and post it on the internet. I kid you not. They made a Tumblr blog to like excel celebrate their acceptance of the way their genitals look. Picture didn't happen, Monica. We're uh, it's called the Large Labia Project. Oh my God! On a, it's a Tumblr blog. Unfortunately, what they d don't understand is how the identifying EXIF information from their photos works. And so, someone posted on the blog, like, "Ladies, um, this is an anonymous comment. I want you to know that because you didn't remove this information, I was able to find." your latitudes longitudes of where the photos were taken and eat by putting putting this into Google I could find even a couple of names at least of the camera owner there are three individuals who once I scraped that data and cross-referenced it with Google I believe I can positively identify and find your phone numbers and your names so <laughs> here's an example of like 
a privacy it's nightmare. Another reason that Craig and Bruce should not put photographs of their labia on. <laughs> you know, you know. Is this is an example of a need for privacy, or is this an example of stupidity on the part? I of think people? it's this is stupidity gone wrong. But like, <laughs> can you imagine your employer being sent a picture of your genitals and someone like ceasing all of your coworkers and being like? Here's a picture of your genitals I found on the large sleeve. <laughs> you know, I found a legitimate reason for your employer to ask to see your genitals, to, to verify. So, so there's a solution to this, okay? And, and this is a solution that I suggest for anybody that has sensitive data that they want to put up on the Internet and they want, it, they want to put it somewhere that's absolutely secure when nobody will see it. What you do is you go to Google+, Plus, and you go to your profile page and you post a, a post in there. You put whatever you want, you know, your name, your social security number, your address, whatever, embarrassing photos, whatever. And you just post it public to Google Plus, and then nobody's going to see it. Um, we have a comment from off. Bruce, <laughs> or a, question, a viewer question. Yeah. Uh, let me highlight that. Go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, this is from I Love Chicks in our chat. He says, <laughs> Oh, link, God. Link, please. I love No, we will not <laughs> see, be linking. This is the problem, though, that you know people complain about how companies violate their privacy when the company doesn't even have the opportunity to violate their privacy before the person violates their own privacy. You can't, a company can't protect someone's privacy if you don't respect your own privacy. You know? So but how I mean, are people you know, so Basically, at the end of the day, is as long as these privacy policies are quote-unquote acceptable, um, if you don't read, read them and you give away some, you know, right or whatever, that's your own fault. And, and Anthony, to, to not to pile on onto that, but how are people so naive that they think that they can post things on the, the, onto the Internet and that people aren't going to figure out everything about them if they want to? Plus, I mean, you don't know what technology will exist years from now. Yeah, I mean, it, it's because don't they don't understand how it works. Pictures, even if you just st don't take a picture of your junk and stick it on your phone or on any device or transmit it in any way. It, no, don't unless, just don't take don't, a picture of your junk, period. Hey, Dan, unless <laughs> you want people to see it. Go watch right. Fried Green Tomatoes. If you're, if you're an exhibitionist and you want people to see it, take your picture. But again, if you don't want anybody to see it, post it on don't Google+. Want Plus and the you're going to be If you coming safe. back to you and being identifiable to you, don't take the picture. If you don't mind it coming back to you and being identifiable to you, then that's your own business. Okay. That's right. That's right. If you want the world to know it, put it on the Internet in any way, shape, or form. And, and you can judge exactly. yourselves at exactly. largelabiaproject.tumblr.com. By the way, there's a great I Love Raymond episode of the Large Labia that, you, that is really one of the funniest episodes. <laughs> His mom <laughs> took a course in, in the sculpturing, and she designed this sculpture. It was, you know, and she didn't, but as it turned out, <laughs> it was really funny. So, For a preacher. Okay, that's all on Labia's folks cool. for now. <laughs> Bruce goes to a fun church. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. So. And this uh, is why the show goes three hours. <laughs> Alan, are you still with us? Yeah. Um, did you have any comment on the large labias? <laughs> it's kind of difficult for me to, to comment without visuals right now, so I'm going to pass on that one. Plus, I think you have your child with you, right? Yeah, well, there is that, too, yeah. So we're speaking in code. Thank God. Um, okay, so, uh, Alan. Uh, very good code. <laughs> awesome. All right, we've got a couple more things here. Should we switch to your stuff, or should we keep going with the list, or what? Let's switch to my stuff, because I may need to drop out at some point. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, let me scroll down here. Um, is the first, help me out here, Monica. What is it, uh, the Google Plus updates? Yes. Uh, yeah, but let's first let's do this. Uh, Google has success with the London Top Shop interactive show. Okay. Uh, what about the Pixel? Have you all already talked about that? We're getting ready to. I'm going to bring Nate in for that one. Okay. Uh, he wants to come in for that. Okay. So um, let's do. Uh, uh, Google has success with the London Top Shop interactive show. Apparently, a collaboration that involved uh, Hangouts, Tumblr, Pinterest, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. 
with over 4 million views in total. So tell us about that. Right. So this well, I have is no idea. Exam. I didn't add that one, so I have no idea what that is. Oh, okay, go so ahead. Uh, Monica. I added it. And I added it because it's an excellent example of like how Google Plus needs to do collaborations with Hangouts I mean, I in order it, to make the platform successful in the future. This was a stunning success because they basically listened to the client and they had the client cross promote on all of their platforms. And so because they did this, they got four million views. But they also incorporated like apparently a separate app on the Hangout that allowed the viewer to like customize clothes. And so, you know, the fans of fashion, you know, loved this because they were able to customize their own look and to basically pretend that they were the fashion model and to, you know, girls love this kind of crap not crap. If you're watching and you're a fashion fan, you know, that's great. But basically, you know, they basically targeted their demographic and, you know, that's why they got four million views because they listened to the client and, you know, it was a huge success. So, you know, props to Google for basically having such a huge success and this is the biggest one so far. That's that's more views than even Google Plus Week gets. <laughs> a few, a couple <laughs> more. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, let me hit the thing and uh, all right, let's um, I guess let, let, let's go to some topics that uh, Priz has here. Um, it's official. Uh, Google, uh, muting when you enter a Hangout. Uh, that's only for Hangouts on air, or is that all Hangouts? based on how many people or is that everybody all the time? What is the deal, uh, Alan? That's, that's all of the Hangouts. Um, that, that's all of the Hangouts, and both Hangouts and Hangouts on Air. And it's dependent on how many people are in the Hangouts. So if there are already three people in the Hangouts, then you'll be muted when you join. That's a good thing. The only thing I don't like about it is that it? Um, I wish it would mute you upon entry, not upon opening the Hangout screen, because uh, because of this, you're unable to to make sure your mic's on and your audio's. No, working. it doesn't. It, it doesn't happen until you enter. You can you can look you can check all your settings before you actually join any Hangout. The little gear button is available. You're you're I, muted. I do that, but I don't I don't see the green bar uh, telling me that I have audio uh, now because of that. If if I'm joining a hang out maybe I'm wrong but um, I'm not sure if it's because of this or maybe that that's always been the case I'm not sure well you don't but see a green bar I'm, I'm in the settings section on this right now and on, on the microphone you see a little green thing going up and down next to the little teeny mic that that's the way it's for me okay um, yeah I, this is a good thing um, I guess the only downside to it is new people coming in that that don't know how to unmute, and then you got to sit there and try to explain to them. And sometimes it takes like five minutes to you know for them to find the the mic button to unmute themselves. Well, five but minutes. But Craig, right. isn't that isn't that, that better than to spam? People don't read. I mean, the, the notice telling you that you need to unmute is right below the mute button, and it has a, an arrow that points right at the mute button. So. If people don't realize they're muted, it's because they can't read. That and and or they don't pay attention and or they're clueless. Something that I do dislike right, well, about and that describes you know most people. So ninety nine point nine percent of so, Google Plus users. That's correct. Something that I do dislike about it though is if I mute myself before entering the Hangout, which I do quite often actually. Um, and I enter the Hangout with more than three people, I still get that annoying little text box that is telling me that I'm muted. And it's like, yeah, of course I'm muted because I muted myself before I even, you know, got auto-muted. So, oh, I mean, it's it's way. it's a tiny yeah. little issue that, you know, I have to click the X and then, you know, but it's still See, kind Google of would, redundant. If Google would issue everybody blue Yeti microphones like, like this one, that has a button right on the front that they can just tap and it mutes the mic, then they could just do that. We wouldn't have this problem. Okay, awesome. Google's a software company. They don't do hardware. 
<laughs> We're going to talk about that in a minute. We're going to talk about hardware in a minute. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to bring Nate. Uh, we got two more topics, Alan, and then we're going to bring Nate in uh, uh, on the Chrome. He wants to talk about the Chrome Pixel. So uh, next up, um, next up, we have um, updates to the Hangout API. Tell us about that. Uh, what was the updates to what? Hangout API. Oh yeah, this is uh, I, I I know how much everyone listening to us is always so thrilled to hear about these updates. Basically, um, there have been some minor updates to the, uh, the Hangout API, so we can do all sorts of new things like, um, and, uh, I'm sure there was something interesting that we could do with it, but I'm not sure what. I think they, this, is, this is the first set of controls that let API developer control who is being recorded in a Hangout on air. That's pretty much the most interesting thing in the whole pack. You mean who's in the center window when you say who's being recorded? Uh, yes, who's showing up in the main window. Previously, the person who um, who owned the Hangout could could blue box a person, and that's who would be recorded. Now we have the app can do that for you. I still okay. here? What's yep. the advantage yeah. to um, that app as opposed to blue screening them? Um, basically, it means that you can create an application and a, um, a, tra a producer can blue screen the person, essentially blue box the person, instead of the person who owns the app. So it's putting more, con more of the features into a program instead of requiring a specific single person to do it. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, so you just like uh, he assigns the timing to somebody in a show, he can assign that to a show. So you could control that so that uh, Dan wouldn't have to worry about. Oh, okay. Uh, so you yeah. can assign that capability to somebody else. So now I understand. Right. Okay. Exactly. And what we're seeing is more and more, more and more of these features are being delegated to the application so that you can have somebody else doing them. Okay. Cool. Any other comments on this topic? No, keep going. All right, I'm going to invite Nate while we talk here. I tried to G-talk him, but it wouldn't let me. Um, I guess he's got me on, blocked again. Now, while we're getting him in, is that, that last feature you just talked about, is that going to be part of the Hangout Toolbox, or is that going to be a separate app? Um, presumably, it's going to be incorporated into Hangout Toolbox as uh, more it gets a chance to do so. Um, Morris is busy starting his new job currently, so I'm not sure how quickly the change will come in. But I expect you'll see this in Hangout Toolbox or in some of the other utility programs very soon. Cool. Okay, so um, I, go ahead, Alan. I'm sorry. No, I, I was going to say, I believe the next topic is something like um, history is history. Yes, tell us, uh, tell us about history. Yeah, basically what uh, some of you may remember is back at I.O. in uh, last June, they released to developer preview something called the History API. And this was going to be a little bit like uh, Facebook's frictionless sharing, except it was going to have friction to it. So it was going to enable programs and websites and whatever would be able to store moments in your vault, and then you control how these moments were released. Um, and suddenly, mysteriously, about two days ago, the, all of the history features disappeared. All of the information disappeared, and nobody knows what happened to them. Is there, are there rumors and pulling of hair and gnashing of teeth? Well, the, the rumors vary from they've either gotten rid of the API completely because nobody's going to be using it, or that they're finally preparing it to leave developer preview and in order for them to do that, they needed to make some adjustments, so they removed everything. So who knows? We'll see. Um, but they've been pretty silent about a lot of things recently. Okay. Yeah. So, um, all right. What's your... So that's what you think's happened. I miss that, Dan, if that was to me. That is what you think has happened. What do I think has happened? Um, 
I am hopeful that they've merely pulled it while they prepare to uh, to release it officially. Okay. All right. Um, let's talk about the. Uh, I'm waiting for Nate to come in, but let's go ahead and and uh, let's talk about the the Chromebook Pixel. It's a. I've seen mixed reviews on it. Um, Neil Patel, the I think he's the main guy at the Verge, said all it does is take you to Google stuff and show you Google ads, and it's twelve, uh, you know, very expensive. Um, and then I've heard other people say it's it's an amazing thing. It's built like a Lexus, and uh, it's high end. I'm guessing there's some margin built into this because if you look at the other the the previous Google products, the Nexus line and stuff, it, it Basically, they were selling it at cost to get people on the platform. In this case, they're going after the high end for sure. And it's definitely um, a beautiful device. It's got the, the highest pixel pixels per inch of any laptop ever made, and you pay for that. Um, it's all cloud-based. There's, what is it? Is it 1200 or 1299 or 1200? And then, uh, help me out here, guys. Is it's it 1299 for the... Um Wi-Fi wi only version, and then, and then there's a uh, 150 more for the LTE the Verizon version. Verizon, uh, Verizon uh, 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 plan um, on their network. So, uh, Alan, what, what's uh, from you know from 10,000 feet in the air? We're hearing good things from Googlers, but what, what's your take on this? My take on it is I can't wait. Um, my, my prediction is they're going to be almost no sales, there, which I think is great because that means they're going to end it out at I/O. You think they will? You think you'll get it in your good uh, in your goodie bag? I, I I'm pretty confident that these are going to be the the big goodie feature at IR here, and and the reason why um, boils down to uh, if you look at all of the the promos for it, they're talking about you know let's let's see what uh, you guys do with this, let's see what comes out of it, let's see what you can do. Um, this is really not going to be a product that I think is going to sell very well. A lot of uh, the reviewers are saying it's not going to sell very well. Anybody who said it says, hey, this is just like a MacBook um, without the operating system. So why would I buy that? I, I think they need the developers to develop for it first. And then people are going to see the fact that, you know, oh, hey, Adobe is releasing Photoshop for the Pixel. Um, you're going to, you, you need those apps to really make people understand why they would want this machine at all. And once those apps come, people will get it. But this is, this is a developer's machine. This is not a user's machine. Yeah, it seems more. It, it seems to be more of a uh, concept and reference um, design device than, like you said, it, it's, it's not going to be a consumer device. It's you know, it's it's kind of like the Nexus line of devices where, you know, Google t shows what they want done with the Nexus line of devices. Um, this is basically the Nexus of the Chromebooks. I really, I really don't see this being in a swag bag at I.O. I mean, goodness gracious, they've already given away two other versions of Chromebooks before. You know, they had the initial giveaway where you could, you know, send in a video and then they had the other Chromebooks. Um, this may this may speak more to what they want to do with a with a, a Google store. I would that. disagree because uh, I would agree. You, you with think this will be in a bag at I.O.? I think it's a strong possibility because up to this point, Google has given away all their hardware at I well, and the developers probably won't buy them. So yeah. if you want the developers to have them in their hands, they're going to have to give them give it to them. I don't know if it'll be in the I.O. The bag, operating but system I, I definitely has been available to develop for another devices. Evident. Given this in a bag is not going to make a developer yeah. change his mind about now, developing. I, I, would, I would seriously bet you $50 that it's in the I.O. I bags. have a question for Alan, Alan before we lose him. He mentioned Photoshop. Now, are you talking about like a cloud version of Photoshop? Because putting heavy programs on this computer seems to be the opposite of what it's designed for. No. Actually, if you look at the specs, um, this is probably one of the first Chromebooks where heavy apps like that are intended to be run on it. But yes, I'm talking about a cloud version of Photoshop. Something a cloud-based cloud version. This has the CPU to handle it. 
something that's graphics intensive, and this is the graphics they handle it. So, so you are saying it would be a cloud-based version of Photoshop? Of course it would. This thing can only handle cloud-based versions of stuff, really. Okay. I just uh, wanted to make sure. I just wanted to clarify that. So it can only handle programs that can be cloud-based. Well, it doesn't have very much yeah, local I mean, storage, it's got a, right? Relatively limited um, on-machine storage. Um, it's got relatively limited capabilities to install plugins that that stay permanently on the machine. It's meant as a cloud-based device. That's the entire implication of a of a Chromebook is that it is a cloud-based device. And yeah, and to demonstrate how to do high processing, really intense cloud-based application. And this is the first machine that can really do that sort of thing. And of course, as we, as most of us know, the the in in most situations, the pr limiting factor here is going to be internet connections in these United States are marginal at best. Exactly, and there are some things like. You know, my fiancé is a scientific researcher. He is always going to require programs that cannot be cloud-based because they're very... There's no such thing as a program that can't be cloud-based. Anthony, believe me, some of these programs he uses are very obscure and... If you, know, you can play, the, if you can play video games through the cloud, you can, play, you can use a program through the cloud. If you, have, I, if you have, you know, bandwidth. Monica, let me, let, me, let me put it this way. I don't know your boyfriend's specific applications. I'm not going to try to pretend to. But if you start thinking about the fact that if all your data is stored in the cloud, if all of the processing can be done in the cloud on, on one of Google's cloud, um, cloud processing systems, then we'll come to that later as well. And all you're going to be using this, um, this machine for is basically to get results back and to let you explore those results. Some of those results may be very graphically intense results. Um, that kind of changes the nature of how you think about your data and how it works. And in some ways, we're actually going back 20 or 30 years to mainframes that are doing this massive number crunching. Okay, well, Alan, uh, hang on one second. We got a, a viewer comment, and then I'm going to get Nate's first reaction. Um, in his specific use instance, though, because he has so many gigabytes, uh, and at this point it might be terabytes, of recorded material, I don't think it would work. I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure about this one yet. Okay, what do we got here, Anthony? So uh, I love chat. Uh, Chex. I love Chexy. Says, uh, how is the loser of the bet going to pay the winner with PayPal or Google Wallet? <laughs> yes, Bruce and Anthony, it's it's game on um, about whether there is a, a Chrome Pixel in the Google I.O. bag. So, uh, Nate, uh, what are your thoughts? A, will the I.O. goodie bag contain a Chrome Pixel? B, would you buy one? And why or why not? And what are your thoughts? Would I buy a Chromebook Pixel? Yeah. I already have. Oh, okay. So that answers that. So On there you go. On the company dime or, or your dime? <laughs> On my dime. Um, do you think it'll be in the uh, goodie bag at I.O.? Uh, I think it might. I think uh, it's either going to be that or I think maybe a mid-level Chromebook. Uh, there's kind of been some speculation that there might be uh, a different Chromebook on offer somewhere down the line. Is it actually technically a bag, Alan? No, it's not a bag, technically. You just get stuff, or do you get a box, or is it? Yeah, so, I'm mean, showing it to you. You get them in, in, in the shipping boxes. You know, the, the boxes they're normally sold in. Okay, cool. Um, so you actually get more value, uh, especially with the Nexus Q involved, um, than than your ticket cost. Okay, so Nate, um, I know you've been thinking about this like crazy. Nate is uh, a regular part of our our Android Week show on Monday nights. And he is a, a brilliant writer from Android Authority. Uh, and he knows all things Android and knows some stuff about Chrome and Chromebooks. So tell us, uh, what do you think? Uh, what, give us your expansive view on the Chrome Pixel. Uh, well, to start with, I'm going to be doing a month-long segment in March 
about the Chromebook Pixel. I'm going to be spending 30 days with the Chromebook Pixel as my only machine um, to see if it is viable to switch to Chrome OS. In fairness, I do 99% of what I do in the cloud. Uh, I've been excited about this for some time. Uh, a big part of that is I hate Windows 8 with an undead passion. Um, another part of that is I was in the market for a premium machine. And again, I do 99% of what I do in Chrome and in the cloud. So it's actually perfect for me. So can you describe hey, what you ask, do, what, what, what that you a quick question, Dave. I have, not, I have not compared the specs to any of the Windows 8 devices. Spec-wise, how does this compare to Windows 8? And price-wise, how does it compare to, to those devices? Well, when I was looking for a, a, a new machine, uh, a higher-end Windows 8 machine, uh, in terms of specs, it's probably a little lower end. Um, it's right on par with the TouchBook Ultra Ultrabooks I was looking at. The, or, I'm sorry, the TouchScreen Ultrabooks I was looking at. It's right on par with those. Uh, again, the the difference is those ran Windows 8 on top of it, and it was when I was kind of testing those out, it was a little cumbersome to get just kind of a straight up Windows 8 machine. I probably could have got more for about nine hundred to a thousand dollars in terms of. Uh, RAM, stuff like that. Um, but again, I, I do 99% of what I do in Chrome, so it really doesn't, uh, let me, having let me Windows doesn't you, matter. Let me ask both of you guys about me, this, me, because let, this is an i5 process, so Alan. A roughly equivalent machine, Windows World, would cost about $300 less, but actually come with Windows 8. I'm sorry, I didn't get all of that, Alan. Sorry, uh, so a roughly equivalent machine on the hardware side would cost about three hundred dollars less. About yeah. But would it be have an aluminum case and everything? No, it wouldn't have been a, as premium at build as this one. Yeah, so it's apples and, it and oranges. Wouldn't have a Gorilla Glass touchpad either. But there Alan, okay, Alan, th this is first of all, this is a touch screen, right? Yes. Okay, so it's yeah. an i five processor, but an um. If you judge that by a typical Windows machine or, or a Mac, then it's it's not really a fair comparison because this is a cloud-based machine. Um, I know, Alan, you have a Chrome box. Uh, what is the performance difference between a, a, a computer with an i5 or whatever you want to compare it to running Windows versus a, a, a machine that is uh, running stuff locally but mainly dealing with the cloud. I mean, don't you get more performance because a lot of the processing isn't done on your local machine? And certainly an i5 is faster than the fastest uh, internet connection. Well, you got to remember how things are working. I mean, what it does on the internet, it's not like every time you type a character and it's somewhere on the internet and then a message comes back and says, okay, yes, you typed an A, here's what you display now. You know, typing something in a, in a Google Doc most of that is still running locally, but it's saving the data continuously to the cloud in the background. Which is actually going to, you know, could slow things down, not speed things up. You know, if you're saving it to an well, SSD, for example, on your local machine, that's instant. If you're saving it to the cloud, that's not going to be instant. Um. It depends, again, on how the, the processing works. One of the things that they've done with cloud-based processing is the data is being sent kind of behind the scenes of what you're doing. I mean, Craig, you, you've you used... It goes and sends it off to the cloud without you having to worry about it. Yeah, I mean, Craig, you've used, you know, a Google Doc where, you know, you and somewhere else, someone else in a different location is, you know, using the document at the same time and, you know, all the information. Yeah, and I've also gotten warning messages where, you know, can't connect and, and, and you know, connecting in a, in a few seconds. And, you know, I've also been had delays, too. Yeah, no, there, there are most definitely trade-offs. But at the same time, largely the way the apps are being increasingly designed is that you can continue to do your work locally. Yeah. And it will get queued up for, for sending it to the cloud. Exactly. Okay, let me ask both you guys, uh, let, let's advance this topic. Um, we've had speculation over the last week about Google opening retail stores. I, um, I don't know if that means they're buying Radio Shack, which I, I totally don't think they're doing. 
or if that means they're going to open up one or two stores, if any. But um, the the first question was, that, uh, is this does this make sense because um, they don't really have enough products to fill a store? But then then a, a couple days later, it leaked about the Chrome Pixel, and then um, they they announced it, and it's immediately available, and it's unlike their previous things where. Uh, they would work with Azus or other manufacturers, and it would be a Google branded product, but it would actually be, you know, sold, um, made by this other company. In this case, uh, I don't even know if we know the OEM uh, for this product. Is that leaked yet, Nate? I, I think. I think they said that it was somebody in Taiwan, but it was uh, a generic manufacturer. Um, and the, the problem with the Google stores isn't the lack of products to put there. It's the fact that their distribution channel has traditionally sucked, their customer support has traditionally sucked, and they're generally incapable of selling anything in, in any reasonable fashion. They need to solve those problems before they solve the problem of what they're going to do with physical real estate. Well, if that um, is not a now, now, Nate, that... when he mentioned that he, he bought it today on Google+, Plus, I said, you know, he said that the purchasing experience was great, I said, yeah, that's because there are 10 people who bought it, and you're one of them. Well, if that's not a ringing endorsement, I don't know what is. Let's go to Anthony for a comment, and then Nate's view on the, the retail store angle, and if this matters. From I Love Chicks. Yeah, do you want to read the comment? Because I'm going to crush that, that name. <laughs> <laughs> From I Love Chicks. Every time I see this, it's a different name. How do you do that? How do you repeatedly change your name? Um, yeah, what are you uh, doing, I Love Chicks? I know. He's, he's all up in that Tumblr site uh, regarding running apps in the cloud I'm also a researcher and use latex when exactly. I write my reports and what are you researching uh huh I wonder what he's researching labia um, large oh my god uh, and Zunger said that Google uh, won't offer it because latex is really slow and expensive to run okay I, I don't understand that. If anyone else wants to comment on that, I, I do want to. Uh, well, yeah, de define Google the Plus market. Science Lab is not currently familiar with latex. De yeah, define <laughs> the market for this kind of machine because I mean, are college students going to buy this? Certainly, business is not going to use this. Well, why, why don't we have Nate give his workflow? Because he said ninety-nine percent of his work. Yeah, but, is but his, but he, he's, but Nate would would uh, be a good example of the small market. That, that would use this thing. I mean, you know, I, I'm I'm in business. We got to run Cisco Agent Desktop, Cisco IP Communicator. We've got to run, um, you know, Outlook and stuff like that. I mean, I guess you could do you Office 360. Do, you you couldn't do all those things well, with cloud-based solutions. No. No, our business. We, we, no. We, no, you no. We run we run Cisco servers for IP voice over IP communication, as do many many businesses. Um, I mean, there's a Why Cisco. Why can't you just use uh, Hangouts for that voice over IP? It's not professional. It's not <laughs> Hangouts would be nowhere near the quality you would need for for doing a, a, a you know Cisco's large healthcare program. Real, I mean, that's the how program the program my fiance wants. needs is called Raven Raven Pro. Um, one of them, anyway. So, so what's I'm, the market for this? That you know, that's my question, Nate. Well, let's let's discuss the market first of all. In everything that Google has put out and said about this uh, Chromebook Pixel, it is geared towards developers. Period. They want a really great machine out there, so it'll push the Chromebook um, kind of ecosystem further. That's the main focus of this: is to get a really good machine out that people can start developing for, and, and early adopters like myself. It's the same thing thing that they're doing with. Um with glass right now, you know, it's, it's all the about the glass developers. And it's the same thing it's, with what they did with Nexus previously. I would say that this has a lot you know, more to do with the developers uh, than uh, the Nexus of, 9 does. I don't know, can you guys hear me? A yeah, friend of mine made an interesting comment about the, the interesting target market for this might be. It's for the, the guy who makes the decision to buy the low-end Chromebook for everybody else. He needs a Chromebook and he's going to get the high-end Chromebook for himself. That could yep. be. Makes sense. Could well, be. you know this is going to be, the success of this is going to be judged by the number of units sold, so they need to get the word out that if that indeed is the market, that this has been divine, designed primarily for developers because, you know, you don't want this thing to get a, get bad press 
uh, and, and then you get a bunch of developers developing for it, and then they come out with better machines, lower priced. Uh, you want them to sell then, so uh, you know, just yeah. But how are you going to know how many? Units yeah, but the, well, and the, the, they haven't. And the other thing is, previously. Google is used to bad press. I mean, they're used to their stuff flopping and not selling and so on. So that, that, that isn't going to bother them. At the same time, though, when is anybody ever, in terms of media or coverage, when is anybody ever? Did it bother RT? <laughs> when, when did it, when has anybody ever really said anything positive, super positive about a Chromebook? Never. Never, and that's so the point. They're used to it. That's what I was just saying. They're used right. to it. And that's my point too, Craig. Is that this is the point of the Pixel? They're, they they believe in this ecosystem. They're tired of getting the bad press. They understand why they're getting the bad press, and they they're kind of taking ownership with the Chromebook Pixel. They're getting these out. It's a great machine. They want people to start developing for it and push this whole thing forward. That's the real aim. Yeah, but there's a liability though for bad press when you're trying to build brand on a Chromebook. That's all I'm saying. Do you think, Nate, that uh, the price of this? Is too high? Should they have built a slightly, uh, a slightly less high quality while still being a high quality device for a lower price? So is this the right price point? Again, this is, this is a device made for developers. Had they lowered the price point, more people would be on board, and then then a lot of people would have spent, let's say, seven eight hundred dollars for an ecosystem that really isn't as robust as it needs to be or should be. So you're going to have a lot of people spending eight hundred bucks and then saying. Why did I do this? I don't get what I want. Yeah, if you're going to go high end, you might as well go high end. At thirteen hundred dollars, like Craig said, it's a really high end price. It's a really high end machine. Yeah. Chrome OS is the problem here, not the machine. It's Chrome yeah. OS, and that's and what they people, want people developing. And if people want to step up and want to buy a high end machine like that, and they buy it and they're disappointed in the hardware, that's even worse. So you either got to go all the way or stay home. I think. And they, they it is a fantastic. Uh, machine for a cloud-based machine I, th I think that they've built in a margin um that's why i'm i'm thinking they might well but dan if you compare this to sure if you compare this to apple computers um you know it it's it's right in there it's it's not overly priced i mean any 15 inch macbook pro is, is going to be that same price but for um, for, for uh or higher but the the problem Nate gets to the the other issues that for enterprise um, the, their the cloud is not a, not going to work. I mean the, the the stuff isn't there yet. Um, and uh, like for what we use for newspapers, we use the Adobe Creative Suite. You can't use that on these things. Um, you ca you can't crunch. You know you can't do video over a typical broadband connection. And frankly, if uh, if you were going to do that, you would. Uh, in order to have that kind of video, you'd have to be in your office or home, and you would probably use a desktop in that situation. So I think the developer is the market. I'm not sure who else the market is. And frankly, for $1,300, you could buy one hell of a Windows machine that would run a whole lot more stuff than this thing will. Yeah, but there's a lot of people out there that don't want the bag of hurt that comes with a Windows machine. Well, but you that's you just man, do what me. we did is sure, you know sure. you buy Windows 8, you take it off, you put Windows 7 back on. It's a headache, but you know. Well, but Windows 7 isn't the you know the cat's meow either. I mean, you know, well, but actually, if, if you are a professional writer, you know, editor, like if you do what my fiance does, you're willing to put up with a headache because the the sort of programs that he's using, you know, are not going to run in the cloud. Yeah, but well, I. I think, that's, but that's the thing. What, what Chrome OS is saying is, you've got your choice of headaches. You, know, you can either deal with the fact that you're going to have continuous operating system upgrades, you're going to have continuous bugs, you're going to have continuous problems, and that's Windows, or we'll take care of that for you, and you're going to have to compromise on the fact that you're always going to need to be next to a network. If that's an acceptable trade-off for you, then Chrome OS is the way to go. That's what they're saying. But you yeah. literally cannot run the programs he needs to run. Yeah, and so it's now not for those in people. The cloud. But so I'm it's not for that. those people. Here's the, here's the thing. You keep, you keep saying, and Dan said this when I when we first talked about the issue months ago. You, you frame it in terms of can you run the program that you need? And I think you're, you're asking the wrong question. The question is, can I do the things that I need to do? That's right. And if That's the right. Exactly. Is no. I would turn around and say, why not? What it is the 
It's the and Netflix. That's where people like me need to step in and fill that gap for you. So, okay, but he's researching and writing an original a species okay, so, guide for his publisher. Monica, this he's is running five different programs at the same time that don't run in the cloud. Monica, he's not going to be the, waiting for yeah. something software to be so, developed for him so the analogy, because he has a deadline that he's got to okay, meet for his so publisher. The analogy is this, Monica. It's like the, guy, the person that subscribes to Netflix and then goes to Netflix and searches for a particular movie and then finds out that movie's not there so they're disappointed. The other user subscribes to Netflix, goes there and browses through what is available and finds something that they like and they're happy. So it, it depends on, on how you approach the situation. So like Alan says, if you go through and you look at what your tasks are and what you have to do and then you go and you look at the Chromebook and you look at what tools are available that run on it, if you can get those tasks done with those tools, then it's an option for you. If you can't, then that's right. You got to go with the bag right. of fur. It's important to look but at. But he's not book. going to not write this book. Well, of course he's not going to uh, switch in the, you know I mean? the book to new software. Let, let me, let, yeah, if let, he can't let me, find tools, he has a work. book deal. Yeah, you know, like, seconds, yeah, if he can't find seconds. tools that will do it on the on the Chromebook, then you're right. He's got to stay with the Windows machine. Give me 30 seconds here. Nate is is a classic example of of of. Uh, for one, he's he's a an Android and Chrome geek, and so he knows you know, it's perfect for him. And also, he's a writer, right, for Android Authority. So this is perfect for him. He can he can use this for his job, unlike me and Bruce, who have specialized needs that we can't. And for typical enterprise customers, they could not use this. Um, but this gets to the larger big picture that Google's going after, I think. Google recognizes that um, stuff is, is going to eventually be, be in the cloud. And, and it, it doesn't make sense um, for, for you to have a, a, a hard drive crash and lose six months of stuff, right? And so that's happened to all of us. I, I literally lost almost a year of my newspapers, the raw files, all of them gone, because I had a hard drive crash because I was stupid and didn't do the right backups like most people don't. So th that's what they want to get to. So they're, they're looking at this just like they're looking at driverless cars. This is not a solution for next week or next month or next year. It's a long-term solution, and that's what this is. The hardware always predates the software. They always have a, a faster computer come out, and then the, hard, the, the software follows, and that's what this is. Um, there aren't all the apps that Bruce wants for, for his business or that I need for my newspaper business, um, out there yet, but uh, Google wants that to happen, and they also want the the bandwidth to be there. And, and that's, that's what they're, they're trying to foster with this you know. with the with this specific device. Hey, I'll take my twelve hundred and seventy nine dollars and buy a Lenovo ThinkPad X One Carbon fourteen inch Ultrabook with a Core i five, four gigs of RAM, one hundred twenty eight gigabyte SSD drive, and, and Windows Seven Professional, and be far ahead of the game than this particular machine. That's just and, my opinion. And also, Bruce will back me up on this. As much as I um, am disgusted at, at Microsoft's Scroogled campaign, which is just complete BS, right. and they're lying, and they know they're lying, um, the, the, uh, as much as I'm disgusted with Microsoft right now, there's no denying that Microsoft Windows 7 is a very stable operating system. We almost never... I can't remember I, the last time I got I, in a day. I would rather have five different kinds of the clap than a Windows machine. You can send me the most expensive <laughs> Windows machine you can find anywhere on the face of this planet. Send it to me, and I'm going to mark return to but, sender but see, on the box but, without but, even but, opening but you it. You don't have a Windows machine, and and you're ignorant of of that experience, Craig. So it's unfair to you. Six years ago, I had them. Visited. I had them six or seven years ago. Well, right. you know, I'll never look back. That's here. like, but, but that's like. That, look, I mean, that what an asinine comment. That's like saying I had an Android phone four Wait, years ago and, and it and sucks. When, so I'm not when was the last time you had a Mac? Mac? That's ridiculous. Come on. Can I, can I interject here? <laughs> you sure. go Mac, you don't go back. <laughs> it's simple right. on the clap or Windows or what, Nate? Okay, well, first of all, Craig, if if there, if you got an issue with the clap, you need to talk to our friend who's commenting about all the latex. He'll solve okay. all your problems. I'm all over that. <laughs> okay. Um, now, again, like in terms of let's say Monica's fiance, he's, he's got his book going on, he's got programs. Can he run those programs on on a Chromebook? No. Is there a web app available that will do something similar? Maybe. That's the point 
of Chrome OS and the Chromebooks is to get people developing so that that bridge is gapped. So that down the line, two, three, four years from now, her fiance can say, there's a web app that does what I used to do with this program. So I'm going to get a Chromebook because I like it better. Um, it's possible. Um, but I don't think, you know, this, these programs are so specific and so technical um, that at this point, you know, six years, seven years down the line, there may be replacements for some of these programs. But right now, um, you know, he's one of these people that's that's pioneering in this field, and because you know, he he was one of these people that cannot switch to a Chromebook. You know, no, I'm not saying you, I'm not saying you can. I'm not saying you should. I'm saying that down, this is what the Chromebook is for that development. So down the line, these will, these things will be available. I I don't think Monica that you're looking to the future because I don't know that the necessary that anyone on any operating system is going to be using. Um, software on locally and that you know in 10 years everything is probably going to be cloud-based whether you're using Linux, Windows, Chrome OS or some other uh, or Mac or some other um, you know OS. I think in 10 years we're going to be headed directly in into the direction of everything being cloud-based or, or, or already be, be there. If we move to Kansas City Anthony's right, and here's why. We've seen the, this trend already. We've seen, for example, big companies like Salesforce.com have moved their desktop applications, which were very, very big and heavy desktop applications, into the cloud. We're seeing Microsoft um, has essentially restructured their pricing system so that it is cheaper for companies to go to Office 365 which is their cloud-based solution, instead of buying licenses for Office on the desktop. Everyone is pushing stuff into the cloud as quickly as they can. We talked about LaTeX. Okay? Let's be honest. LaTeX was designed for a mainframe system. That's where it originated. It's going to return there if it isn't already there. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if there are already at least two LaTeX editors that are cloud-based. And how could this possibly go wrong? I mean, another topic that we have up for discussion this week is China and what they've been doing most recently. You know, you, you with can't the cyber live, attacks. You, you can't live in fear. My company, Regmans, no, 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 let me go answer that. Let me go answer that one. Okay, and I'm gonna answer it quickly and then we're gonna move on. Uh, China's attacks have all taken advantage of local local bugs. The fact that Java is installed on your system means that your system is vulnerable. Okay? That is not a problem with the Chromebook. It's not a problem with the Chromebook because if a bug is found, they can push out a fix immediately. They have not just taken an advantage of local issues. They have also done such things as spear phishing and they have been successful. There are major issues with our grid that have been vulnerable to attack. Point we are right. so, so now you're talking social engineering problems, and that's a totally different issue. But all of the oh, there there are multiple issues, and we need to advantage of local installation problem. Okay, this, let me this ask is a, this is okay, a whole other no, topic which we actually should address okay. on its own. Yeah, it's issue. a lot harder to secure but, millions and millions of individual computers than, you know, the, the main servers and all that. that this feeds back are, into the whole issue of, of privacy and the, the no, issue doesn't. of having There's no it. privacy on the internet. Okay, r real quick, let, let me ask a closing question. You uh, guys cannot from... refuse to address this issue because it's one of the major issues of this generation. Okay, Monica, okay, Monica, Monica, let me address this issue quickly and then we will move on. Okay, let's look at which companies have been affected and have been hacked into most recently. Facebook was hacked into, Twitter was hacked into, Apple was hacked into. What company is missing from this list? That doesn't mean Google is invulnerable. Oh, Google is missing from this list. What is that? Google has made an intense, very intense dedication to privacy and security, and it shows. Move on. Okay, uh, I, and I I'm sorry, Alan. Which has gotta, the government 
had any major issues? Yes. Let, let me. Does let that me. disturb you at all? Oh my God. It's good. Um, we're all disturbed. Okay. Uh, let me let me ask a closing question about the Chrome Pixel. Uh, we we know that this is very advanced hardware for a a cloud based device. Um, it's not super advanced for a, a local device. The 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 one of the big concerns, just like with an electric car, you're concerned about you know can you drive across the country, you know, and that's what Tesla's dealing with. With the case of a cloud-based device, you're you're only as strong as your internet connection, and so obviously Google is wants people like Adobe and Salesforce and other companies uh, to develop apps that enterprise uses um, to, to to you know make their devices uh, able to do everything and every you know for everyone. Um, one of the big problems, though. That Google is is looking at trying to address in Kansas City and and reportedly beyond those borders is the bandwidth issue, and until we get really good bandwidth um, across the country, these devices aren't going to really be practical in the same way that until Tesla builds out their charging stations, uh, the the Model S isn't isn't going to be practical for everybody. So my okay, question Dan, is, Dan, let me click. Go let ahead. Me quickly answer that. Basically, yes, we need bandwidth upgrades, especially on the up uh, direction. But for a lot of the people are doing, that's not really a critical issue. A lot of people are still doing their work where they have wired, where they have wired connections with decent uplinks for most of what they're doing. Most people are not going to be transmitting video. Most people, when they're uplinking, they're going to be transmitting. That's pretty much it still. There's the other issue that the, there's two other issues. One, the the bandwidth thing, um, the fact that uh, most of us have a single cable company that delivers the good bandwidth, and it doesn't make economic sense for everyone else to run wires to your house or to your business because the first company that comes in, just like if you get a Sam's Club first, you're not going to get a Costco. If you get a Costco first, you're not going to get a Sam's Club because it does doesn't make economic sense because everyone joins the first one, nobody joins the second one. Um, the second thing is Wi-Fi sucks. It was deliberately chosen. That frequency, uh, th that spectrum was deliberately chosen because it sucked and it's unlicensed and it, yeah, anybody can use it. And and um, again, Wi-Fi wi is, is there are solutions that are going out to that. Wi-Fi are giving us higher bandwidth, and still people are still mostly either next to their Wi-Fi or they're plugged in. And, and the final, the final point, the final point, um, Alan, and then I'll, uh, after this we'll go to Nate for his final thoughts on this. The final concern is is, is getting back to what Monica said. Um, if someone like Bruce has his data in the cloud and he's got insurance customers, which would have all kinds of data, personal information, um, he might be very, very reluctant to store that information in a cloud system. Um, as all these big companies are getting hacked all the time. This week's been especially bad, anecdotally so, but that is a legitimate concern. Uh, on a hard drive, it, 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 it theoretically, it you're closed. Is, you know, well, address let me, let me that. that quickly. It absolutely is a legitimate concern, and I'm glad people are thinking about it and addressing it. And that's what Google is doing. But if you look, for example, at, you know, you're about to say, well, it's stored on your local hard drive, then nobody can get at it. Go think that to the Iranian nuclear researchers who somehow got a virus on their, their cyclotron and, and infected, you know, it, it is possible to infect local systems. It's been done, it's done all the time. It has been happening for decades now. You know, the malware existed before the, the internet was, you know, attached to every single PC. So these are, are real well, legitimate in, problems. In, but they in, real legitimate problems for decades. Moving to the internet didn't solve those specifically, but what it does do is it puts the security in the hands of people who know what they're doing, like Google. So, so you know, people who don't know what they're doing, like the 13-year-old kid who might have installed your PC. So I I agree with that, but the other problem that that Monica brings up, and I think this is the thousand-pound gorilla in the room, and that is the our internet connections and the monopoly or duopolies that we're dealing with where we have no choice. I have to buy it 
when I'm up in Maryland from Comcast, there's no DSL available at that location. So I have one provider that I can choose from. And if they choose to jack up those rates because I'm doing everything in the cloud, uh, they can do that and I'm stuck. So that to me is, is my biggest concern. I don't care about security because everything I do is public, but I, I certainly care about how much I have to pay each month for my internet access. I think that's a problem. I agree. And I think that the monopoly or the duopoly systems that we blended ourselves in have caused this problem. But I think at the same time, we are seeing that companies, uh, even when there's a modest amount of competition, have started buckling under. Okay, let's go to Nate, and then we'll move. Uh, Nate, uh, solve all of these obstacles for us uh, toward... Uh, the, the future cloud-based system. I mean, there's some legitimate concerns here, right? Well, yeah, and you know, one of the concerns is obviously uh, security of the information. Um, Google has a lot of stop gaps in place. In fact, probably more than anybody about um, people getting into your information uh, that you don't want to be getting into your information. Now, as far as businesses, uh, like you know, they use Google Apps and things like that. You can, businesses businesses can actually audit who has seen the information and when. So if you've got sensitive customer information in there and you feel like that it may have been compromised, you can go to Google and say, I want a full audit of who accessed this information and when, and they will tell you. Um, now, in terms of the big businesses getting hacked, that's true, that happens. On the other hand, how many of those big, business, big businesses or anybody else that has been hacked is on uh, Google servers? I don't think any of them. Uh, as far as cost is concerned, we live in a capitalist society. Costs will rise and then costs will fall. This is what happened with the Nexus Unlock device. It was at $350. That was That is much lower than anybody else has, and you will see prices fall because of that. It's not about how much they can get in term, as much as it is how many people they can get. They do vo they, People are worried about volume over, pri over a premium price. Okay, so... Um how many years, final question for Nate, how many years until a cloud-based computer like this Chromebook or its successor uh, will become mainstream and, and be as useful, if not more so, than the desktop systems that Bruce and I are using for our enterprise uh, productivity? Well, you know, that's that's a really speculative question, and that really depends on developers and how much they can do and in what time frame they can do it. Now, if you have companies like, for instance, uh, a Photoshop, if Adobe can build out a really good Photoshop um, client that you can use as a web app, then you'll see a lot of people start switching to that kind of thing immediately. Same thing with, like, uh, you know, anything else you use, Quicken, anything else. The better they can build out good web apps, it'll start to happen. Now, when do I see this happening realistically? Five to seven years. Okay. Yeah, Quicken's a good example because they actually have a great cloud-based app. Uh, we use it for um, our invoicing and all of our accounting stuff. Uh, uh, Quicken or QuickBooks Online or whatever you call it, and it's fantastic. And my uh, my billing person can access it from. You know, we we can be on the phone together looking at an account from different places. You know, she can be at anywhere. She, you know, on lunch at work. Or, or wherever, and uh, we can all be looking at the same data. It's it's fantastic, and I don't have to worry about a hard drive crashing, and um, have no idea who owes me money and and lose a hundred grand because right. you know my backup system failed. And, so and that's you, a good you, example, but that's not a a, a a a crunching thing like 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 video or you know some of the Adobe Creative stuff would be. Right. But right. yeah, that's and, a great example of of someone who's gone to the cloud very early on. And you really need to, the other thing to keep in mind is uh, in terms of, you know, all these problems that we're having, you know, Google is really the, the only company that's tackling all of these problems. And you really also need to decide who do you trust? Uh, do you trust Google with your information? I do. Do you trust Google to build out a really good fiber system? I do. Do you trust Google to give you low, low cost, high end devices? I do. So we're but totally that's not the only issue though. Google. I'm getting scroogled and proud of it. Go I ahead, love Monica. You getting scroogled. But that's not like that's that's, and 
what until we get to the the issue with China and the spying, you know, like can we really only you know get into the full implications of this? Like part of the issue is is that we really have not been paying attention to the full implications of this issue. Like China is fully denying that they have set up a center for the theft of intellectual property from the United States. And this, you know, is a great deal of how, you know, it, historically the Russians did this for us in the Cold War. Um, Germany did this all the time in World War II. Um, you know, like this, this is how people and and China, like part of the, the major, the elephant in the room is that they're basically lying about it. Okay, when in history was anybody honest? When did Russia say, oh, you caught us spying? Okay, sorry, let's go have some vodka. That you know, never you, happens. you can talk well, about that the was companies a major driver. getting hacked, but you, how often do users get hacked? At least when the companies get hacked, A, you know that it happened, B, the, you know, honest about it, well, usually. Um, but when a user gets hacked, the user doesn't even necessarily know that they've been hacked. But this well, has been I mean, happening how again and again in the past six years, how and how we have how not often wised up. Do what we need to do Let's stick to our topic list, and, and, and sabotage is as old as time. Uh, Fine, we'll get to that article when we get to that article. Just steal, just steal um, all their brains through our immigration program. Let them all immigrate here, and then we have no problem. All your brain or belong to me. Okay. Still, still um, all next up, uh, the full Alan, billion of them. I know Nate. No, um, just the smartest. The I know Nate. You, you million came in smartest. Talk, I know Nate. You came in to talk about the Chrome uh, Pixel, but you're welcome to stick around as long as you'd like. Um, but uh, the next topic, and, and these are all the geeky Alan topics, which, which are right up your alley. Um, next uh, is Google Drive now gets a light box preview mode. Alan, tell us what this is. Is Alan gone? Well, because if Alan's gone, I can talk about it a little bit. Why don't you talk about it, and I will call Alan. Okay. The Lightbox feature in, in Drive is a lot like what you see when you do a Google image search now. Um, when you select an image, it'll pop up at the bottom in kind of a, a darker background behind it, and then there's the other images at the top. It's really just bringing that to your Drive photos now. Uh, I have it on my, my Drive is uploaded. It's a really nice feature. Um, it, it makes scrolling through your pictures and looking at all your pictures that much easier. That's cool. Let's prank call Alan. Yeah. Is I'm your refrigerator Alan. running? I'm calling <laughs> Alan. Seriously, to... ask him that. Do you have Prince Albert in a can? <laughs> Alan. I'm calling Alan. So oh, can... God. Yeah. Hey, okay, we're talking about the uh, light box thing. Um, okay, yeah, quickly. This, this is neat. This is basically that uh, they, they made a change to drive so that you can kind of cursor back and forth in a light box light version to look at previews of files there. This is, I think, pretty pretty nifty and pretty key, and I grouped this with the, the pixel thing to, to point out the fact that they're trying to make these changes in drive that enhance how Drive works and how Drive integrates with uh, your your Chrome device. Okay. Um, get it to so work. Can you describe how you get it to work? Yeah, it's real easy. If, for example, you've got a um, a, a picture in Google Drive, you in, in the directory listing, you click on it. Yeah, That's but for it. me, it just opens up a viewer, and it doesn't have that. I can't browse from picture to picture. Yours just simply has an updated no, no, it, Oh, it, it hasn't it updated? Up, yeah. You can browse from picture to picture by, by clicking on the right and left mouse buttons, and it puts little arrows there. It looks very, very similar to how uh, the Google Plus photo viewer looks, for example. Okay. Oh, I, yeah, I got it now. Cool, because I didn't have it before. Now it says, voila, new viewing experience in Drive. So You're welcome. I just did that for you, Craig. You're welcome. Cool. Thanks. You're welcome. Man, you're pretty pretty I do what I can to, I do what I can to help. You're pretty much all that. I do what I can to help. Is it hard to be the man, Nate? You're, no. You're, no. you're all just, that. Yeah, you see that was for me? Come on. <laughs> I'll just tell you, um, the hardest thing about this show when Alan calls in by phone is um, when he talks, he's going through my feed. 
So I'm on screen and the hangout, and so I have to look solemnly toward the camera while he's talking, uh, like a. Yeah. Now, Mac does any server. does anybody know how soon this feature is going to come to Google Drive on the on iOS on the iPad, for example? Uh, I don't know offhand, but it would probably be you know a, a couple of months still because you know of course it's a very very difficult platform to develop for. It's kind of backwards in a lot of ways, so you know I wouldn't I wouldn't count on it too quickly. Oh, man, okay, I'm getting rid of this junk. Okay, yeah, you should just throw out all your Mac products there, Craig, uh, and get some real Windows uh, Seven <laughs> PCs. Um, <laughs> just dream. All right, uh, so so guys. Um, uh, what would you do if you had glass? Is a topic I guess Alan added, and Alan post you posted some pictures of you wearing Google Glass, and we're not jealous, not at all, not not a little bit, girl. Um, so tell us uh, all the Google Glass secrets and and what this story is about. I cannot tell you all of the Google Glass secrets yet, although I I can't wait until I can tell them all to you. Uh, at which point they won't be secrets anymore. But Google this week uh, released a new Glass website that uh, features a video of people actually using Glass and what it looks like to use Glass. Uh, some photographs giving more details about Glass and its functions, and essentially opening up a contest. So you now have till I believe it's February 27 to create a, a post of 50 words or less saying how you would use Glass. The 8,000 most creative responses get the opportunity to buy glass. You know, I want to. I just want to say that this is a very unique contest where, by winning, you get to pay someone. A lot. Yeah. 800 bucks an ear. Alan, uh, I'm going to go to Nate on this uh, next. But Alan, um, what is your uh, to put you on the spot here? Three years from now. Whatever Google Glass is and ca uh, looks like, or whatever it's called, uh, what will the price be for the consumer to purchase? Well, let me put it this way: one of the things that was released in an article from the, the Verge today, um, in an interview with Google, the, the Google executive in charge of Glass indicated that Glass is going to be out by the end of the year. This is a consumer version; will be out by the end of the year. My prediction is that the consumer version will retail for about five hundred dollars, and it will be uh, not like a three G thing, right? Because it'll be by by nature, because it's right next to your brain. It, it can't be right. It, it'll have to be uh, uh, tethered to you know via Bluetooth or, or something to some sort of other device, correct? There, there are some articles out discussing that today, but I cannot discuss that. Okay. <laughs> so why why do you say that then, though? Um. What would you what you say? What was that, Monica? I, I just was curious as to why Dan made that connection. Because of radio uh, interference, brain. Oh, I wouldn't think you'd want a a, a microwave antenna affixed to your brain. For right, but yeah. but the cell phone studies like have basically shown no connection between that and brain cancer. And there have been so many studies done on cell phones. But so there's many still studies. Um, a law, I think it's uh, uh, it's 0.6 watts um, that can be next to your head and it's 3 watts if it's a detached cell phone or mobile device. Um, I wouldn't want to stick my head next to a microwave when I was cooking. So Dan, so Dan, you as think long as you don't stick your head in the microwave and it is outside the microwave, you can put your face right close up to the microwave and you are absolutely safe. Promise you that. I, mean, I was when I was that, young. I was food. told by a misinformed parent, like, don't look at the microwave while it's going. You know, like, but that is not true. You can look at the microwave. I promise I think, you. you know, what I'm saying is the, the the amount of power that could be generated right next to your brain um, safely uh, is different from the amount of power that could could be generated from your belt pack. Uh, just so, from a, like I said, long term <laughs> studies have shown no correlation between brain cancer and using a cell phone. But you're somebody who probably is against HMO foods 
uh, based on speculative evidence at best. I am not against GMO foods based on speculative evidence. I do believe that long-term studies should be done on GMO foods. You are the first so that we know. speculative conspiracy theorist I've ever met. I am not a speculative conspiracy theorist. I do believe that studies should be done so that we add to the majority of scientific evidence. Nate, make, make But sure I don't believe know. that we should make assumptions before the fact as to what those studies are going to prove. I mean, I think that's our job is to speculate on things. That's what people No. <laughs> Sorry, I have we to have fall on the and side of science. We I, don't make I, judgments. I just want to speculate on the end. fact that I don't have too much more until I need to, to sign off. So if there's other things you'd like me to comment on, uh, let's get to them. Okay. okay. Um, Thank you, Did you have so, a quick Okay, Nate, did you have a quick comment on that before we move? On which one? Uh, <laughs> okay, you don't. Um, all right, so... Bam. Um, glass is going to cost slightly more than a Chromebook Pixel. And Glass is getting a redesign, apparently, which surprises me. Alan, is that one of your stories? Did you put that in? I put it in. I put all of these in. Well, I either I, I reviewed all of them. I can comment on all of them. All right, I put the design one in, Chromebook and I want to talk about it. Go through this. So you know, I don't know where that that came from. There is one article that said the glass is, that said that I think that article is kind of pulling numbers out of thin air because they didn't actually justify it. They they kind of said, "Hey, glass is going to be available by the end of the year, therefore it's going to be expensive." I don't know where that number came from. I think it's yeah. All right, so it's it's, it's expensive. Uh, next next up, uh, Google Glass uh, to get new design. What's that about? This is uh, a TechCrunch article. So I added yeah, this one. Go ahead, and, go ahead and explain this one, Monica. So I don't understand this one at all because, first of all, I think Google Glass, the prototype, has a classic design. It's sleek. It's streamlined. It looks awesome. And that's part of why I think everyone is so psyched to have it because they actually hit on a really futuristic, amazing look. And then basically they're saying, like, Ooh, I think this is too cutting edge. I think we need to have someone soften the design. And I wanted to face palm and I was like, no, Google. Like, this is a kick ass design. Stick with it. You know, I think that the design looks good if you have long hair and your hair is like covering your ears and the the arms on for the ears. Um so I think it looks good on most females. Um I think it looks bad on men. I think it looks pretty amazing on pretty much everyone. It looks futuristic. You know, it's everybody that I've seen wearing it, you know, they look pretty kind of intimidating and it's a cool it's a cool look. I like the colors that they've seen it in so far. So they could introduce it in more colors. And they need to figure out what to do with people that already wear glasses. Nate, um, I heard a rumor, is it true that um you uh, not not connected with your role at Android Authority, but you're going to create a, a Tumblr of naked women wearing only Google Glass. Exactly. That's a hundred percent what I'm doing. That's what so, I've been working on. That's why I need that terabyte of storage and why I bought the Chromebook Pixel. <laughs> I'm holding up for the Jordy LaForge d uh, design. Is it is is the design patented? I mean, could you make a fake version just so people could like be cool? Like you could walk in there and say like, Oh my God, it's a Google Glass. You could say like Alan. I, I can't talk about this. <laughs> and you could get checks, which, of course, is, you know, the goal of everything we do. Um, all right, so that's, uh, okay, that's awesome. All right, uh, th th this is really cool. There was a great story that Alan shared, and I didn't see Actually, his. Actually, let, let me just finish wrapping up with the Monica one. Uh -huh. um, part, of that story is, part of that story is that they are talking to current frame designers Talk about how to integrate their frames with Google Glass. I think it's interesting. Oh. I think it's novel. I think we'll see where it goes. But I think it's a it's a good step, indicating that Google is very very attentive to the design of these things. Go ahead on right. to the next one. Okay. And they do need to like I said, like I love my glasses, and you know, like I if I got Google Glass, I'd want it to you know fit with my frames I already have because I love these. 
you know so so f fitting with people's personal style that they already have if they already wear glasses is important but if I didn't wear these glasses I would just wear their prototype because like I said it's badass it is badass and Monica <laughs> I'm waiting for the first picture of you wearing only Google Glass Google Glass uh, yeah boy that could be a great calendar um, calendar idea for Android Authority there uh, Nate. I'm gonna make a hashtag next about Monica and Google Glass. <laughs> next topic, and yeah. Monica. Next topic, real quick, is um, glasses. Uh, th th this meeting, the Life Sciences Breakthrough Prize. Uh, it was very interesting because in the in the earnings call with Zuckerberg, he said that uh, there was no conversation between Google and Facebook, or it, that that's the way it was reported. I'm not sure the exact quote. And so uh, that didn't come as a surprise because prior to that, remember a year ago or so, there or, or a little bit more than that, um, there were stories about Facebook calling up PR agencies and news organizations um, trying to drum up negative publicity about Google. So there was like a war going on of sorts. But then we saw this, uh, this nonprofit exercise going on and Sergey Brin was there, Sergey with his wife. And Mark Zuckerberg was there from Facebook, Sergey Brin being the co-founder of Google. And uh, uh, Sergey's wife was on the stage with um, Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg, the Facebook founder. And they were uh, on this thing. And then uh, Sergey was wearing his, his uh, Google Glass. Well, well hang on. Let me, let, let, let's pause there for a second and talk about what this thing is. Okay, We've talked a lot ahead. before about, about moonshots, about encouraging science and technology research. Um, this is a case where a bunch of really, really rich people essentially stood up and put money where their mouth is and said, we are going to dedicate $15 million a year to people, to, to researchers who are willing to, who are doing good things in the life sciences field. These are not people who have, you know, uh, who are, have won Nobel Prizes. These are people who in 10 or 15 or 20 years might win a Nobel Prize. And this is to encourage them to do more research in fields that are important. And I think it's worth noting that um, Sergey's wife is a biologist. She's uh, the CEO of 23andMe, which is a genetic research group. Um, Zuckerberg's wife is a pediatrician. These are people who are dedicated to doing things in the life sciences, and they're they're standing up and saying, "Hey, we need to to make rock stars out of people who are who are doing this kind of research." Amen. What did you guys think about? I mean, that's awesome, but the, the most shocking thing to me was Sergey Brin being observed uh, chumming it up with Mark Zuckerberg and taking his uh, Google glasses off and putting them on Mark and then adjusting them for his head and then uh, they said it had a snowball had fight you know there's a difference and there should be a difference between a company and another company hating each other and that those same two companies executives hating each other well, but can I, the can I ask you, a question? you shouldn't you shouldn't have the mindset that um, Google and Apple had with you know Steve Jobs versus Eric Smith. You should have this kind of relationship where Facebook and Google don't necessarily like each other, but um, Mark Zuckerberg and uh, um, Sergey Brin can be in the same room and have a um, you know a discussion with each other without you know getting all upset and let, such. Let, let me let me also mention that a third person who is there is the. Um, the chairman of the board at Apple. So we had all of these companies had, had senior people there in this room. Now, we know that the companies have a rivalry. And I think the companies having a rivalry is a good thing. Um, but, it, but it shows that the people at the heads of the companies and, and probably most of the people in the companies themselves um, are at, at, at some level amicable with each other. And I, I think that, that Sergey and Zuckerberg talking to each other at showing Zuck uh, his, his Google Glass, at showing them where they're going, and Zuck responding by saying, yeah, I've got three people who are ready to, to write the Facebook app for Glass as soon as we can. 
that shows that, you know, these guys can talk to each other. And I think that's good for everybody. I'm going to have to sign off now. I will try to be back on shortly. All right. Sounds great. And Thank you, Alan. Nate, let me ask you, um, is this, as uh, Anthony describes, um, you know, they still hate each other, but on some levels they connect, as, as, as Alan describes, uh, or, or, you know, playing for the cameras because, you know, the press is there, so they have to say all the right things. Or was this an uh, evidence of, of a potential genu genuine thawing of uh, relations? Well, let me, let, let me first say Anthony's got a lot of good points. Um, just because, you know, they're competing with each other, that doesn't mean they need to be jerks to each other, especially in a social setting where which doesn't really involve anything to do with business and competition. The other point that needs to be made is Mark Zuckerberg was one of the first people on Google+. Plus. So at what point is Mark Zuckerberg fighting with Google about anything and not interested in Google services? Um, he would have... He, Mark's... Mark Zuckerberg is at his core a geek just like me and you. He wants to see toys. Sergey had his glasses on and Mark like any of us would have done if we were had the opportunity would have said, "Can I check those out?" So, I think that's so such I a also, cool story Monica, isn't it? I mean, the, the, wouldn't you have loved to have been watching as Sergey Brin and and Mark Zuckerberg were like playing with you know Sergey's toy and and like well, check it out and this is awesome. The, the toy aspect of that does not actually interest me as much as the science aspect. Um, but the uh, one thing I want to add is that like part of why this award is so important is because research and federal funding for research has been really cut and slashed. And so while we have had so much funding go to things like defense and while we're spending so much on health care and that's inevitable and I'm not saying we should slash that but while we're spending so much on defense and that kind of thing the research budget has been slashed and so we're not actually seeing research into these critical fields and so to have these awards go to these people who might make some life-changing discoveries in these fields is amazing so this whole prize and the idea behind it is really incredible and so I'm really happy to see it happen and I think it couldn't have come at a better time but I also want to make people aware that the slashing of these budgets like we critically need governmental funding into things like science and medicine because when it's done on a private scale just to do things like to develop a drug for a specific instance or you know for in a specific field when we don't do it for a generic reason then it tends to be you know we don't have when we don't have it for a very wide scope of reasons then it tends to be very limited and we don't see the great accomplishments that we used to, to strive for in the past okay I gotta close this in about 12 minutes so um, it's a long story why, but I have to because I have to be able to edit the YouTube thing. All um, right, then let's go through uh, the topics and pick and choose. Right. I think we're going to have to jettison the priest scandal, <laughs> the uh, Pope okay, scandal. Real, real quick. No, 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 we got, we got, we got room uh, for the Vatican. Um, uh, Google I.O. tickets go on sale March 13th at 7 o'clock Pacific time. $900 for, $900 for the general public and $300 for um, academics. I think it's free for media guys like me, which is <laughs> keep hoping. So, uh, um, okay, so uh, um, okay, so uh, Google tries to offer support for back-end cloud services. What's that about? I don't know who put that in. I didn't put that up there. I don't know. Okay, good. Um, moving right I, along. I put up this next one. Taking sides in the tech wars, Microsoft sides with Oracle against Google and Java appeal. I think if uh, Google walked on water, Microsoft would proclaim loudly, uh, "Google can't swim." Yep. Um, so uh, give give me ten seconds on the, this, and Nate after that. All right. Well, apparently Microsoft decided that it would throw its hat in the ring with Oracle against Google in the Java appeal. 
and it's kind of just another way for Microsoft to be like, we hate Google, and it's really pretty ridiculous. Um, Google's counter argument was that it didn't violate Oracle's patents, and Oracle can't copyright APIs for Java um, because it's an open source, publicly available software language. Nate, does this Which, go anywhere? Does this go anywhere? No. no. We, we covered this pretty extensively uh, on Monday uh, on our Android Week. Um, all this really is is Microsoft's petulance, and they're living by the friend, or the enemy of my enemy is my friend. That's all they're doing. Absolutely. Good quote. Good quote. Absolutely. Okay, so um, ironically, uh, speaking of Microsoft, we're going to go on to a, um, a Nazi story. Um, Amazon used neo-Nazi guards to keep immigrant workforce under control in Germany. This, I mean, as much as I despise Microsoft's current campaign, uh, while still praising the stability of Windows 7 of, over their previous iterations, um, this is kind of a bum rap. I mean, Microsoft, I, I can't imagine Microsoft approve, uh, personally, you know, approving, you know, yeah, bringing yeah, the Nazis. That, that sounds so sensational. I don't think they were at some sort of neo-Nazi rally with, you know, flyers for employment, but who knows? But I've heard, you know, there have been claims of, of the Amazon centers, even in America, um, operating at, like, super high temperatures, treating their employees like crap, um, making them work at just outrageous hours um you know this, I read, the second or third time i read the <laughs> article and it just i mean i don't know what the independent is i don't know what the caliber of writing is and oh you know, the independence it's, trust, it's very it, trustworthy it's, I'll it's tell legit. You what, i read the article and it made me puke reading the article because it was that bad i mean i am not good at writing but i could write something better than that just you know as far as the grammar and sentence structure it was it's just like it may you know like i said i don't know what the independent is but having read that article the very first time it made the reporting style look terrible and i um you know a lot of it seemed you know fact based but at the same time it's like you know it makes it. It seriously makes me wonder if these facts are being, you know, handpicked and you know, you know, shaped into the way that the writer wants to shape them. And um, it sounds bad, but at the same time, I just don't trust the source. I don't trust the writer, at least. So, no, the Independent is a verified source of journalism, um, and I, from what I've reading of this, the article. It seems well written, so I don't know where you're coming up with this, Anthony. But well, regardless, your opinion, my opinion, um, that's my opinion. <laughs> Anthony, how could you possibly criticize a British tabloid for the journalistic skills? Okay, um, next up, this is uh, fun stuff. Uh, Bill Gates says Microsoft made mistakes in early mobile strategy. What's that about? Put that one in. They they blew. I mean. <laughs> I've been saying this for a long time, and I think that um, a lot of people have been saying this almost as long as I have. Microsoft is terrible with Steve Ballmer at the helm. Um, there's a quote in um, from uh, uh, Bill Gates in it. Let me try and find it real quick. Um, where he said... Uh, Oh, he says, Bill Gates says, there are a lot of amazing things that Steve's leadership achieved. Windows 8, the Surface computer, Bing, Xbox, is it enough? And then he goes on. And that quote just makes me go, there's a lot of great leadership that he's achieved. Windows 8, that's great leadership. The Surface computer, that's great leadership. Bing, that's great leadership. Xbox, yeah, that's great leadership. But Steve Ballmer didn't introduce the Xbox. Bill Gates did. <laughs> So well, let, let me stop you there. The, he's not going to the Bill Gates is not going to publicly come out and say his CEO is worthless or, or doesn't provide good leadership. The only way you're ever going to hear that is with Steve Ballmer has been removed from his position at Microsoft. Right, and it's I not going to be any chatter. I, I entirely agree with that sent, sentiment, but the you know the, what he said is not true at all. You know, he's saying, "Oh, these products are all great," and no one 
outside of Microsoft is going to tell you that those, you know, I think it's three or four products are great except for Xbox. And the one product that he says that I would agree is great is a product that Steve Ballmer didn't introduce and, you know, he that Bill Gates did. So, um, you know, basically what I'm saying is that he's listing a whole bunch of program uh, of uh, services and such that are not great and the one that he do, that actually is great is something that Steve Ballmer was not you know the genius behind it. Uh, You're right. Nate real quick uh, d- d- does does Gates still have a controlling interest in Microsoft? Yeah he does. So he could can Ballmer at any time if he wanted to. Absolutely. Um Maybe not, he him owns all the stock. He, maybe not him specifically, but he could definitely lean on the board to do so, and he would get that. Um, now, really quickly, Microsoft, it's worth noting, Microsoft was the first company with a real and viable operating system to have a smartphone. They had a very, very, very popular smartphone called the Samsung Blackjack a full year before the iPhone came out. This is a lineage of Microsoft not understanding and not taking my, mobile seriously. Interesting. Okay, and then um, uh, Monica, we, we we got like three minutes, uh, and we got to still do the wrap. So give me a real quick synopsis of this completely crazy breaking st- scandal story. Okay, so rumor has it that one of the reasons that uh, Pope Benedict may have resigned is that. He has been handed a secret red-covered dossier that includes details about a network of gay priests who work inside the Vatican but also have cross-dressed and have been caught in the act, um, living it up in Rome, um, cross-dressing and partying in Rome. Um, And so basically when the Pope was handed this document, he decided that's it folks and decided that he would be resigning and so he locked up this 300 page dossier with all the film and the evidence and the next Pope's gonna have to deal with the fallout of this scandal as well. I'm seeing, yeah, something from the Guardian there. Um... Benedict's um, Pope the street, I don't know the correct word, term as Pope (laughs) has been one that's been rocked with controversy Um, and so apparently this might have been the final straw Um, final words Monica on this Google Plus week my final words (laughs) about the Pope or I'll say in 30 seconds or less Okay, Uh, Google had some spectacular hangouts this week and if you have not gotten a chance to watch that ISS hangout watch it because it was really cool so awesome. go for it uh, Anthony final words so I have 30 seconds quickly yeah does that mean I can count from 1 to 30 oh my god How much I'll let you go to Nate <laughs> uh, Nate uh, I'll make it really quick um, don't expect everything to happen for you immediately and always 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 support your developers absolutely and uh because somehow, some way, Nate needs to figure out a way to pay for that Chrome Pixel he's buying for thirteen hundred dollars. I thought you were loaning me the money. Absolutely, I'm, I'm, it's it, your pay for an, our in the week. Um, hey, thanks so much for watching. Google Plus Week airs every Friday at eight p.m. Eastern Time, seven six five p.m. Pacific Time, on Google Plus and YouTube Live. Oldest show on Google Plus, and uh, it's so much fun, and we get to meet interesting people and. Uh, argue with Monica. Monica talks with her hands. She'll slap you. My favorite conspiracy theorist. Um, (laughs) Whoa. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful Google Plus week.